I give you John Sattler, this is going to be a treat. Thank you, David. What I'd like to do now is, uh, these are different faces of our guest, of John. Uh, you need to know what shaped and informed him as a young man growing up outside Pittsburgh. He was a, a, a nationally ranked wrestler. Uh, his dream was to go to Penn State, but you ended up going to the academy, and indeed you went to the NCAAs three times? Yes. Yeah. And, I did. And it's a big part of your life, except you remember, like all wrestlers, you remember the match you lost, didn't you? It's a long list, but I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was one or two names, but I'd be uh, disingenuous if I said that. But I learned something from every one of those thumpings, you know. Yeah. You know what doesn't kill you makes you tougher. I am one tough son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember anything in particular as you think back to those wrestling days? I remember my senior year. Of uh, college or high school? Yeah, you know, uh, of college. Yeah. The Eastern Championships were at the United States Naval Academy and Navy and Penn State were lined up for the finals, and I had to beat the Penn State two-time returning outstanding wrestler in the East for us to win the tournament. So here you are, he got my scholarship. Were they right or were they? <laughs> uh, so you think, uh, to use a biblical phrase, it was David and Goliath. <laughs> we got out in the mat, I could not find the pebble. It was not there. So uh, slingshot, no pebble, you know, they, uh, the, uh, if you go through the Eastern Championships, at Penn State, where they won it that year. So the uh, the learning of being beat at home in front of my home crowd, in uh, and the other sad part about it was the individual who beat me when the national anthem was playing. I'll never forget this. We were all locked at attention. All the midshipmen were locked at attention, and uh, and he found it quite humorous. So mm. now they were all going, "Wait, our guy gets you." I'm going, "Not be quiet up there." Now. <laughs> yeah, don't, he's already tough. We don't want to make him mad and tough. But, uh, so you asked me, but another character builder there. And uh, 15 years later, I'm having dinner with my father one day, and we're sitting there, and I'm, in, I'm still, I'm in the Marines, obviously. I think I'm a lieutenant colonel. You know, right in the middle of dinner, he looks at me, and goes. You really looked bad that day against uh, that Penn State wrestler. <laughs> I, go, I go, hey, Dad, I mean, Thanks, you're my Dad. dad. <laughs> you're supposed to say the sun was in my eyes, bad call from the ref. <laughs> no. So, you know, it was tough love, tough love, David. That's great, that's great. Well, you know, as I look at those different sort of faces yeah. of you, I think the face you're most comfortable in is the lower right when, when you're, you're in your fatigues and you're out with the men and women. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, I, I think the same as in business. You know, it's, it's one thing to be in the boardroom, it's another thing to be you know, escorting VIPs around, but when the time, the true, the true leaders, those who understand what it means to be selfless servant leaders, you have to get down as far and as low as you possibly can. The Navy has a great saying, on a Navy ship, on the very back end of the ship, there's a thing called aft steering. And there's a couple of sailors back there that if the steering goes, if the bridge gets knocked out, they grab a little like hose and they go, hey, wake up back there. <laughs> you, you guys are now driving the ship. And you got Eddie, Mary, and Bob back there who, who have never thought they'd be called upon, but they grab it and they can, they can power the whole thing. And the Navy, a great line in the Navy is, you will not own this ship until you have visited aft steering, because it's all the way down to the bottom, past the engine room in the back. I think it's a great, it is yeah. a great analogy. So when you get to be a leader, if you think it's the corporate dining room, the parking spot, the, uh, the first class tickets on the airlines, uh, the truth be known, those are all distractors. They detract away from you and being that selfless servant you know, with your men and women, uh, women leader. Yeah. And I've had some uh, pretty bad discussions at, uh, at some businesses. One guy came up to me and said, I've worked my butt off to get that parking spot. It was right in front of the building. I saw it when I came in. I said, it's a nice one. Got your name. <laughs> it's got your name up there. And every day when every worker walks in, they look at it and your car's not there. And, and they're riding around and they think, wonder where he is, or, you know, uh, well, I'm sure glad he has this spot. So we had a little bit of this on it. Three months later, I got an email from him. This is one of my success stories. And it had a picture of that parking spot and it said, employee of the month, nice. Martha Brown. And that's what, and he, and he, and he always said on the email, all it said on the email, it said, got it. That's all he said, <laughs> got it. But, uh, you, know, we, yeah. you know, entitlement, you know, I, I mean, if you start to feel entitled, you need to have a friend that has a Louisville slugger and willing to use it. You know, yeah. whack you once and uh, get yeah. you back online. But we're getting off. off no, that's all right. So let, let's tell you what, why don't we put that away and okay. we could just chat some. What we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation. Join in, raise your hand at any point. Uh, and at a certain point, I'll just open it up to Q&A and we'll, we'll go from there. And then um, 
we'll, we'll take it there. But before I do, you know, we, we, we want to thank you for your service, uh, and you're still serving in many ways. But can I ask anyone who's, uh, who's uh, first, any Marines here? Stand up. Hoorah. All right, All right. first, hoorah. And I understand. And I understand someone's driven up all the way from Atlanta to be part of us. Thank you, Ed, for doing that and the good organization that you run. How about anyone who's served in the military at any point, any of the branches? How about any sailors? Navy, Air Force, Army, hurrah. So how about that? Right. So thank you. And Coast Guard, Coast Guard. I didn't want to leave the Coast Guard. That's why I knew it. <laughs> Separate Paratus. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, you know, uh, you like sports, uh, I suppose a few people in this room sure. do, and, and uh, when I grew up uh, in our household, uh, my father was in the Navy for a short period of time. He was a CB uh, as an engineer, uh, and my uncle, uh, my mother's brother, was a career Army man, tank commander, uh, served two Purple Hearts, retired as a lieutenant colonel wow. uh, after a long and distinguished career. But the annual Army-Navy football game <laughs> became a problem. <laughs> Who do you root for? Which side? Uh, I've noticed this year the Navy, the Navy lads are doing pretty well, aren't they? Uh, I think in. seven and two right now. Uh, and we were talking, and uh, they beat Notre Dame this year. They've had the last three games, they were underdogs. Lost their starting quarterback and lost their team captain, middle linebacker. It looked like it was going to be a, a cataclysmic season. But... We have the opportunity to take all of our team captains at Navy. We bring them all together and take them to Gettysburg for an offsite. But say so again, you take your team captains. How team many teams? Captains, 23 uh, teams? 33. 33. 33 varsity sports, second most in the nation, men's and women's, right there together. And then we also bring the leaders inside the brigade. They, they run Bancroft Hall. If you were the university president, you have 30 fraternities called companies. Each one has freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors totally in about 150, and a senior runs that show, 30 of them. So, so like a took, platoon leader. Could yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're actually company commanders, company we call them. And they all come, then the six battalions, each one has five companies, they come, two regiments and the brigade. So all of them are 21, 22. We bring them all together at Gettysburg, and we only pound three things. We call it a commander's course, like you might take your executives to an offsite. And what we do is we tell them three things. You must define what is your uncompromising standard, i.e., what does good look like? If I come to practice or I come into, into my company every day, I don't know what good looks like. I'll make good up in my own mind. Some will make it real high, and some we call them bottom-dwelling minimalists, the ones who just want to be there to say they graduated from. They're not hungry to get out and lead, motivate, and inspire. They'll set a different set of standards. But if I, if I don't tell you what good looks like, how do I hold you accountable to the standard? Can't do it. So they have to define that. They, that's uncomfortable for them. They don't like that. They just want to play hard, lead by example. You know, that's I'll play hard, and by me playing hard, the team will play hard, and we'll win all our games. But it, it's more than that when you it's get into that. the character. So define the standard. The next thing, even harder for them, we make them define loyalty. What is loyalty in your organization? Loyalty to my workmates, uh, loyal, loyal to the company, or is it loyalty to the core values and the, uh, what the company stands for? So you need to have that kind of a discussion. So they define peer loyalty, my teammate or my, my company mate, and they find, in our case, loyalty all the way to the Constitution. Because it's a higher it's order loyalty. You higher, have. Absolutely so, higher. So if I work for any of the fine companies in this nation, at a certain point it stops with, with the various stakeholders and shareholders involved, whereas you're really talking about a greater good, a common good, a, a noble... Thing, the Constitution. I, absolutely, but I think you can lowball your loyalty on the uh, on that axis to be my bonus. You can mm -hmm. low, lower it to be my quota if I'm yeah. in sales or, or if I'm in engineering. I just got to get this done, and pretty soon you start start to forget about the people, the men and the women that make all that happen. So once they define a the loyal, the last thing we do is we make them write at age 20, 21, 22 an action plan on how are they going to take their definition of what good is looks like defining loyalty, have an action plan to get buy-in from all their co, because they may be appointed the company commander with 145 working, but they're all midshipmen. So how, and they call it peer leadership, even though I am, I have been appointed, hired my peers, 
It's just like when you go to be a, you know, somewhere in a company, everybody's there and all of a sudden you're promoted. How do you motivate, lead, inspire, and hold those accountable who you were just sitting at the table with last year before you got that promotion? Company's counting on you to do that. And, and your yeah. peers, if you do it right, will respect you and admire and revere you to get that right. So the reason I bring that up is because if you watch a Navy football game, least penalized team in the nation, they don't make mistakes. If you watch every player on every play, they, they, they tenaciously pursue their assignment. The play's over and there's some back, defensive back still being dogged by some running back downfield, but he doesn't, doesn't have a rear view mirror. As far as he's concerned, every play is a touchdown. It completes and it's, his mission. It, 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 absolutely the mission. I know how I contribute to something bigger than myself called the team, called your business, called the academy. And my, what I do reflects on that. So, so how about all the hot dogging? Like, you know, the sports are exuberant. You've, you've had a brilliant catch in the end zone. You know, there's a little bit of flamboyance in the NFL, one might say, and for, for that matter, anywhere in, in college sports, too. On, on all the teams, not I mean, the, the men's, women's swimming, lacrosse, men's, women, basketball, it is not the individual. We have a saying that there's men and women who want to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. I want my picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated. What we want are men and women who want their team on the cover of Sports Illustrated. We want to be national champions. Now, I have to play my butt off and bring my best talent, my A game every day, so I can contribute to something bigger than myself. So they just interviewed the coach, and he, he actually referred to the, uh, the book Gates of Fire, written by Stephen Pressfield, one of the Spartans of Thermopylae, and how that uh, King Leonidas built a 300-man force which was 100% dedicated to the men and women on, in this case men, men and women on their right and left. And the phalanx, the shields, didn't protect you. They all cocked to one side. Oh, interesting. So yeah. if I panicked and scared and I moved my shield, I created a salient. So the, the team, the loyalty, the dedication to something bigger than yourself is absolutely huge. And, and it just, I just sent a, a note out to the two team captains because one, the one who, who had a season ending injury, uh, you know, I told him, you got to find a way to still lead. You know, when you're on the battlefield and you're wounded, you may not be able to go mano mano, but you can do other things to inspire your organization. Mm -hmm. And this past weekend, I looked out and he had a little scooter for his leg, and he went out for the coin toss. And nice. he came back on the sidelines, and and one of the other players went to the coach and said, Coach. I want Danny Gonzalez's number. I want to wear his number wow. in the game against Houston. So wow. here you get in the stands and you look at, whoa, Gonzalez, is he back? No. Mm -hmm. Another selfless player took his own number off. To He wanted to, to pay homage him. to the leader mm -hmm. who was on the sidelines. And, and when, you, when you can build an organization like that where it's not about me, it's about us. And they use, when they're interviewed, they say, we had a great game. You know, they, they, they must drive the interviewers nuts because they like that I, me, dancing yeah. in the end zone. You score, you hand the ball over. The only celebration is your teammates crush you. <laughs> they, you know, you make a good hit, you got eight other people pounding you. But you don't go, ah, oh, you know, hey, anybody see my number? You know, yeah. I mean, it's just the, it's the antithesis of being the self and servant leader. And the coaches and the institution across all of the teams have pounded that into them. And the, the last story, there was a, a game, one of the, one of the, there's seven Just and two. Just the season, so, right? Yeah. yeah, one of the nine games. I'm not going to tell you which one it was, but one of the players got down, and he was down on the ground, and the opposer got up, elbowed him in the face, and gave him the old gut punch, and then kneed him. And they have it on the game film. They saw it later on. The individual got up, looked at him, and walked back to the huddle. Because hmm. Navy can't afford a 15-yard penalty. 15 yards, we can't dig out of it. We have to score every time we have the ball. Same thing in the pool when you're on a relay team. But the coach said, the best play of the game is the one no one saw. This is the, the head football coach, Coach Kennedy Matalolo. The courage, the commitment, and the, and the self-discipline to not take the penalty because he knew, I'll, I'll get even with you later on on a good, clean hit. But right now, I'm not giving you 15 yards. Hmm. And when you hear that, you go, wow. Whew. Pretty, uh, pretty special. But that's what you want, your, your, your women and your men who are leading the Navy Marine Corps team, West Point, Air Force, wherever it is, if they're out there representing you on the field, a lot of judgment comes up, and they gotta make the call for the right reasons, not for personal reasons, so. So how does that, you know, think of the, how do you in the, in the, in the Navy and in the Corps, how, how do you get people who are, they're, they're competitors, right? They, 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 don't, they wouldn't have gotten there if it hadn't been for individual excellence. So how do you take a bunch of individual high testosterone, high performers, males and females, and get them to become a team and to subjugate their own desire to be the star? 
No, it's the same as in any industry. You think I get good people and by osmosis they'll grow in to be, when I'm ready to make a manager, they'll know what they're supposed to do. But the truth be known, they're probably, when they leave your office, you go, I'm gonna, you're gonna be promoted to X, they probably have a bag when they get back to their office breathing in it because, my God, I, I don't wanna fail, I wanna do well, and I did well where I was, but that didn't necessarily prepare me to, to go to the next level. So when we bring in about 1,100 a year, there's probably seven, seven individuals qualified for every one that gets in to go really? before the admissions wow. department. Uh, the, the, you know, the college board scores, the athleticism, everything's just off the page. It's, a, it's absolutely phenomenal. But even with that, a lot of them come in for the wrong reasons. Sometimes it's college. I, have, I came in for that. I had eight brothers and sisters. I came because my dad said, I have two sisters, your two sisters are in college, son. You could really help the family out. <laughs> and so, wow, there's a good reason to go to the Naval Academy. But, you know, so I, don't, you know, I know why I came. And so you're the I, first in your family, right? I was the first, well, I was the only one who, who went in the military of the nine kids. But uh, I only tell you that because what motivates you to come in shouldn't motivate you to stay there. Hmm. You, you need to, so we have at the Academy three credit course when you're a freshman. It's probably the only institution I mean, maybe Coast Guard Academy, West Point, Air Force, et cetera, three credit mandatory leadership course, your, soft, your freshman, sophomore, and junior year. Hmm. The great philosophers, what makes me tick? How do I build teams? How do I employ teams? Then how, how do I take that team and do great things with it? And then your senior year, we bring graduates in. Uh, back to the point we were talking about. We bring a graduate in for each table, 50 at a time. They run 27 each semester where they cut class only time you're allowed to cut class at Navy, <laughs> where legally, legally, but uh, and then they have a graduate sit at the table, and the graduate facilitates a full day of real world leadership in the operational forces, hmm. to be on a ship, in a squadron, on a submarine, or on the ground. So, I mean, Admiral Red, and I'll stop, because I know you got other no, things you want to cover, but Admiral Scott. By the way, I don't interview John, I just sort of like, I just follow the, you know, the. <laughs> But he has that Louisville <laughs> slugger, I saw it. <laughs> so Admiral, I'll do my Jerry Springer, watch out. That's it. Now, I think the Naval Academy, they just came out and rated all the colleges. It was uh, like number one for the uh, highest percentage of graduates, 89 with a STEM, science, technology, and engineering, and math, where over 50% of the grads were in STEM. So they're, they are, of course the dean's really proud of these statistics, as you should be. Well, Admiral Scott Red graduated in 66, a dynamite, dynamite sailor, went on to be a three-star, stood up the counterterrorism center after 9-11, just an unbelievable quality uh, individual. So we asked him, what would be three things you'd tell these young college you know, men and women coming in? He said, first of all, I'd tell them that your calling is to be a warrior. I don't know why you came here, but you're staying here because you're going to be a warrior. You're going to you're going to lead men and women, possibly in a harm's way, and win the nation's battles when called upon. Hmm. That's the reason why you're here. And she used the word, if I can interrupt, the, the word calling. I mean, that's a profoundly sort of theological term, the uh, vocation uh, uh, of vocatio. That this is not something like I want to, it's my dream, it's my plan. There, when, the, when someone is called in the biblical narrative, it's often to something that's difficult, painful, and we may not really want to do. We may not really want to do it. Well, and, and, and you all have tough days wherever you are. We know that, but if you have a calling, you know, you don't whine, moan. Yeah, you, you know, step you, up somehow. Yeah, you step up and uh, you worry about yourself later because you're, that's that selfless, it's called service. You know, you're serving and the only kind it really works is selfless service, all else before self. So your calling is to be a warrior. Second thing he said is that your job will be to be a leader. Hmm. I mean, you, you may have a physics major, you know, aerospace engineering. We have some of the smartest people in the world going to be astronauts. But your, call, you know, your, your number one responsibility when you walk out the door is to be a, a leader. Hmm. And, and the third one is your credentials uh, aren't your diploma. Your credentials are your character, your hmm. character. What is in your wheelhouse of character when you walk out? I mean, so you think about that. And the beauty of it is, who, can, who controls your character? You do. Mm -hmm. So that one third of which you, your character comes in. If you have to go, look where I went to school, look where I got my doctorate, my PhD, you know, my master's or whatever, then, then you're looking in your rearview mirror. Yeah. And Admiral Red would say, through the windshield, my friend, looking through the windshield to, to lead, motivate, and inspire people to, to do things. I mean, leadership's easy when we're all having ice cream, cake, and candy. It gets really hard when the owner's things have to be accomplished. So mm -hmm. true leaders can get men and women to do things either they don't think they can do, a lack of self-confidence, or they think they don't want to do. And when you can master those two, 
and I believe you're ready to go to the head of the class and, and, and take the next step. So character formation. Uh, tell us a, a bit about your story. So you grew up with nine siblings. Uh, what helped shape and inform your character? And, and talk maybe a bit about just sort of your Catholic upbringing and what role that, that played in, uh, in a quiet way, making you part of who you are today. So just because we had nine kids, you assume we were Catholic? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, a little birdie told me. Whack. <laughs> <laughs> also, we went a strong Catholic family. Uh, really? Oh. Did you get, wow, how about that, yeah. I still remember my senior year in high school, I was a... I was you could have been Mormon too, by the way, why we play stereotypes here, so part of my family's Mormon, I'm allowed to say that. I was, <laughs> I was president of the Older Boys Society my senior year. Uh, you know, I was kind of like Richie Cunningham, I diverted later on in my life, so, but, uh, but I was sort of that, that kind of guy, that's just the way we grew up. Strong family values, during Lent we went to Mass, all of us got up and went to church every morning, and, uh, and my dad, uh, he had a moral compass that I think it was painted on the wall. It, it wasn't a free-flowing noodle. Every, mm. Everything he did was, it was easy. You know, he, if, it ha, if it was moral or ethical, the decision, he knew what it was. It was just how you're going to implement it. So he didn't so, have to look at some rule book or no, he just Nor did he have to go, how am I going to look at the end of the day? Will I have more money for my family and my kids? No. If it was ethical, it was, it was black and white for him. Yeah. And I told you the, the, uh, the story. We came back from Canada, took five of us up, and we went canoeing. And we came back late, and we put a hole in the bottom of the canoe. We had stuck chewing gum in it. We were paddling like, you know, as fast <laughs> as you could, you know, one bale and one paddling to get back in. So we get in, and it's late, and our car is right here. I mean, we've been out for five days in the boundary waters. And my, oh, dad, said, my yeah. dad said, it's beautiful up there. My dad said, I have to go wake the guy up. And we go, Dad, what are you going to wake the guy up for? He goes, well, we put a hole in the canoe. Dad, there's a stack of like 100 canoes here. We just throw our canoe on. And he goes, no, but we put a hole in this one. Hmm. And I still remember, Dad, I mean, it's like... a Midnight. What he, so he knocks on the door, and the guy comes to the door and looks out, and he goes, "Wow, well, somebody hurt somebody." You go, "No, everything's fine, but I put a hole. In, we put a hole in our canoe." He said, and the guy went, "What?" And he, my dad said, "We put a hole in the canoe. We hit a rock on a, you know, going down through some rapids, and it's that one right there. And I need to pay pay for the canoe to have it fixed." And the guy said, "In all my time of working here, no one has ever <laughs> ever told me they put a hole in a canoe, and we have holes in canoes all the time." He said, "Let me shake your hand now. Let me go back to bed." That's what he did. So, but my brother, I mean, but but it's those little things in life. So that's what sort of shaped me: yeah. strong, strong moral and ethical background. My dad, we we volunteered for everything. All the kids, some of the church needed to be done. It wasn't, isn't it? Isn't it the Kelly's turn or the O'Brien's turn? No, it was. doesn't matter who did it last time, we're going to be in. So yeah. that selfless servantness was in my DNA. I just, I just didn't know it. Yeah. So. You know, the, the Bible is full of uh, warriors, right? And, and so, is, there, is there any warrior that just happens to be a hero figure for you that you, you look back and go, wow? Oh, you mean warriors on the... the well, you think of you know, the King David, a lot of the Old Testament is oh, battles yeah, yeah. and fighting going on. Uh, well, I like David and Goliath because I was always a small <laughs> guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir, we got one in the back there. William. So could you explain the warrior ethos and how it might apply, or does it even apply, or how might it apply to the business world? Because warrior is a, a strong word. If you've never served in the military, no. what's that mean? Is it a video game? I mean, what are we talking about? Now, it's not so much the physicality. The warrior ethos is a lot in, inside that, that character, wheelhouse of character that Admiral Red talked about. It's, it's being prepared to take you know, the physicality forward if you have to, and, and if you have to, unhesitatingly, and do it with dominance. We got all that. But it's making those calls because sometimes young men and women think, right now, you know, go for your gun as soon as you walk in the saloon, and that's, that's not what it's all about. It's having that judgment. It's having the moral compass and having a strong ethical background that you know if it's legal that, and you can do it, it doesn't mean you should. So if it's black and white legal, then you get the moral and the ethical that kind of blends into that. For example, uh, when I was in Iraq, believe it or not, we could drop a bomb, take out a target. If we did all the geometry of the bomb, the splash of the pattern, the houses in proximity to the target, the, the model will give you an estimated how many non-combatants will be wounded or killed. It's called, the, they call it the bug splat because when you do it, it looks like a bug hit your windshield that fragments up. So they take the template down, they lay it. Then you can change the heading of the aircraft coming in so it goes towards the soccer field, not towards the housing development. And if it's a business, uh, it's in an industrial area, you hit the target at night when nobody's working. You know, when we were talking the other day on the phone, you, you just in passing mentioned 
uh, and I may have the number wrong, but that uh, last year 20 commanders were relieved of their, their, their post for various infractions, uh, uh, a bit of an ethical nature. And you just said it just casually and you went on, that wasn't the point of what you're saying. I said, wait, stop. In the corporate world, how often when someone is dismissed for an ethical lapse or an ethical malfeasance, do, do we talk, not that you have to name names, but it sort of gets swept under the, car, the, the carpet. You sign the non-disclosure agreement and suddenly so and so is gone, but you never really know what happened. But the fact that you, you would talk about that, that some men and women who you probably held in high esteem slipped up at some point, uh, maybe, or maybe they were perennially toxic and it took a while to be caught. Talk a bit about that. Well, we, we have a process across all the services. It's called command screen. The, the, the number one screen. thing, command screen. We want to screen somebody to take command of that ship, of that army unit, of that Air Force squadron, whatever, missile, missile air, whatever it is. If we're going to entrust you to command 30 to in some cases, I mean, when you get up there, 50,000 warriors inside the Marine Expeditionary Force at the top, then, you know, two, three, uh, two stars that each had a chunk of that, then it goes to colonels, then it goes all the way down. But when you pick the lieutenant colonels up, you screen them, a board meets, and you look at hundreds to pick the right ones. And you have their whole record in front of you, what they did as a lieutenant all the way up to then, and you make a judgment call as if your son or daughter was gonna be in that unit. That's mm. the best I can say. Mm. Fist fights in the room, arguing over the last couple of folks because mine, you know, I, I think you know, you're wrong, et cetera. But at the end of the day, everybody feels good about the process. But even with that amount of structure into it, we, uh, not in the Marine Corps, but across all the services, there were about 20 commanders relieved for mm. some things like a lot of it has to do with uh, you start to become entitled you start to feel like you don't need your staff's advice anymore, and then you become toxic, meaning- well, That never happens in the corporate world. Well, I'm sure it doesn't. <laughs> but, but the difference in the, in the corporate world is, you know, I can be toxic, but I can also be a playground bully because I control your bonus, I control your promotion, I control your livelihood. Hmm. You could say the same thing about the military. If you came up and confronted me, uh, and I, I could, I write your evaluation. But the beauty of that is it's small, whatever, you know, even though the military's close to a million men and women across all the services, you know, the, the walls have ears and people, people recognize it. So I've never had to, but I would never, I mean, I've stood up to commanders who admitted today hey, that's probably not the right thing to do. And I've had plenty of them come to me, not, not because I was toxic, I don't believe, but because I made a bad judgment call. And they were willing to come up and say, boss, that ain't gonna work. And you say, okay, come on and let's sit down. And they talk you through it and you have an epiphany. You go, wow, thank God you did this. Especially in combat where somebody yeah. might, you know, some life limit eyesight's on the line. So I, I just think when you pick someone and, 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 and that's your lady or your man, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of, that's your horse and you're riding it on in uh, and it doesn't start to work, your ego will sometimes want to, you know, we, we call it putting lipstick on a pig. At the end of the day, it's still a pig, but it's got big red lips on it. And you go, how do you, you know, everybody else goes, still a pig, but you're trying to fool them. When you get into that situation, you have an ethical and moral responsibility to the organization to try to make it right. I'm not saying shoot them on right off, right off the bat, but eventually you're all being watched, I'm being watched to make the right ethical call. And sometimes that's removing someone who was my horse. Yeah. And that's, oh, that's hard to do, very, very hard to do. You know, when you see them, you look at them, you see their family, their kids, the weddings, the college coming up, but it's just not working. But you also have to look beyond that at everyone who's suffering because you haven't made that call. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to do, but if you can't go knee to knee, face to face, and tell me what I'm doing wrong, this is what good looks like and you're not there, I'm gonna give you a little bit more chance to get there and I'm gonna help you get there. But if it's just not gonna work, you can't chase that forever. Yeah. So. What are some of the things, if you look at ISIS and what's going on in Mosul right now, the, the men and women who are trying to to retake that city and the human shields that are being used. How does that square with a, a United States understanding of um, uh, ethics of combat, let's say? Well, if you go back to 2004 and then 2000 in Fallujah and then 2006 in, in Ramadi and some of the other big cities that where we were doing the fighting alongside of the Iraqis, we were, we were on the vanguard. They were in the middle, uh, right next to us on the flanks. Uh, so they were still in the combat, but we had, our men and women are so un unbelievably well trained uh, that I, I, there's just no way I can hold a candle to them. So I am not talking down to the Iraqi forces. They came up to this level, but we did a lot of the, of the frontline fighting. Yeah. 
Uh, and then when they did fight, we had 15 of our warriors embedded with each, each one of them. Hmm. So they saw a lot of combat, but they, they had the backbone and the moral compass was in some cases a soldier or a Marine or a sailor or an airman who they would look at and, and they just give them one of these, no, this isn't the right thing to do, let's keep moving, mm -hmm. and, 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 they, and they would do it. So mm -hmm. they're gonna, they're, uh, I think the beauty of it now is it's been tough on them. They're, I think they'll, they're probably pretty close to taking Mosul. Mm -hmm. Syria is another story right now, but mm -hmm. ISIS or ISIL, it's either you know, the Islamic State uh, of Iraq and Syria or the Islamic, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is the Western Med. Uh, the, the Levant was their dream. They wanted the great caliphate to expand, so they threw the L in there. But they're nowhere clear, close to being mm -hmm. taking the Levant. It's mainly Syria and Iraq right now, to be totally candid. Uh, they'll lose Mosul, it's gonna happen. They're overextended, they can't hold ground, they don't have the logistics to make it happen. And eventually, that'll erode and they'll break down and, and those who can get out will and some will as they did in the, and when we fought them in Fallujah, they, they became fanatics. They just wanted to die for the cause. And you know, our young men and women gave them the opportunity to surrender once. And mm -hmm. if they wouldn't surrender, then they honored that wish. They died mm -hmm. for their cause. Mm -hmm. And it, it was not pretty, but it, it was done. So once that happens, they'll, they'll just go back down into being a global terrorist organization. They'll look for these, like you saw, attention world on the internet, everybody, do what you can, get trucks, drive them into the Macy's Day Parade, all those things that are coming out. Those are just desperate acts to keep, keep the organization alive, but the ultimate dream to create the caliphate, the Islamic State, which they eventually saw, it's the whole world. It's not what all Muslims believe in, but it is ISIS under the banner of yeah. that, uh, that we're gonna bring back the caliphate, or bring the caliphate forward, it's gonna start in Iraq and, and morph on out. It's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But they are still, I mean, you, you, if you ever went online and read some of the websites, some of the things, it's, it's just intimidation and, and it's, uh, it's brutality. And it's, it's organizations and, and conquering people through fear and holding them under your thumb. Yeah. No one wants to live that way, whether, whether you're in Iraq, Afghanistan, or, or you know, Libya, yeah. on Western Africa with Boko Haram. Those are just all nasty, mean thugs. And they need to either be captured or killed. That's the bottom line, and that's happening. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to open up to questions in a, in a minute, but uh, uh, let me ask you one more as, as people begin to think of what they may, may want to ask you. And that's, you've spoken in the past about the difference between moral courage and physical courage. Uh, talk about that in a military context for, as a warrior, and then can you transpose that to the marketplace, to the boardroom, to the, the sales floor, whatever? Sure. Sometimes the physical courage, we give awards for you know, uh, seven brands of, uh, of valor, starting with, in our case, it's a Navy achievement with a V for valor. Then it goes to a Navy accommodation, a little bit more valor, a little bit subjective in there. Then it goes to the Bronze Star with a V, Silver Star, Navy Cross, Medal of Honor. So when you hear all this stuff on, on, the, uh, on the news about, well, we should have had more Medals of Honor, well, when you start you know, at the beginning of the battles, and I was in on the front side, you sort of stratify that because you don't want to change your standard where, whoa, you're wearing a, who gave you your silver star? Oh, you got it from them or from him. Well, I served under this. Well, that would have been a bronze star. You don't want that to happen. So it isn't like we're, we were stingy with valor because it was, you know, I came out of my paycheck or something. It was just that we, we thought that was the, uh, the absolute right thing to do. So when you reward something, as in business, you, know, you, you get what you inspect or what you reward. Even if it's a handshake, a pat on the head, if I like that, I'm gonna work hard in, in that environment. So the valor piece comes easy. Uh, when you're there and something happens, it's hard, and, and when you watch and read some of those citations, you'll go, oh my God, where do we get men and women like this? Where do we get people who would completely put themselves uh, off to the side and dedicate themselves, in some cases, to a warrior they don't even know their name. Mm -hmm. They just know it's a fellow warrior in trouble and I'm going. And uh, so the physical courage, uh, we, we, we reward it, we, we talk about it, and we sort of prepare yourself, if my time comes, will I do the right thing? But the moral courage is even harder. Mm -hmm. That's when you have to stand tall, maybe go against the lynch mob to be the only one who stands up, or the moral courage to bring someone in and tell them they're not getting the job done, and I'm gonna have to move you because everyone else is suffering. 
And in, in our case, when you don't or do the fear, latter, right? or, yeah, or, yeah, or the moral courage, your boss is going to yell and scream at you, yeah. but you know it's the wrong thing to do. Well, hopefully you don't have a boss like that, but if you do, that's not an excuse for letting it go off the cliff. you got to step in the breach, stand tall, look them in the eye. And then and you walk in and you caveat it. We tell this to the midshipmen. They call it captain-itis. Captain-itis is fear of the captain. Hmm. I know this isn't the right thing to do, but I don't want to approach the captain. It also comes out of love of the captain. Hmm. If you are the benevolent leader who everyone loves and you're wrong, they may not want to come and tell you that your idea is a bad one because they, they revere you. Hmm. So you can have it on both sides. Now, I'd rather be over here. I'd rather go in and say, you know, I don't know how to bring this up. And I mean, I had my Sergeant Major come in one time. He was crying, sir. You know, I, I don't even want to. I, I hate even having an idea that's different from yours. But he was about, Sergeant Major, just tell me, what do you got here? <laughs> and when he did, I went, oh, my God, was this stupid, what I was about to do. But, but so, but I've also, I, I, I've seen it on the other side where whew, today's the day I'm going to do it. Whew, tomorrow's the day I'm going to do it, you know. <laughs> I think maybe things will change by Christmas. You know? <laughs> I was just with a company, we're going to weather this for 18 months. Why are you going to weather it for 18 months? Well, that's when his or her contract runs out, hmm. and you don't think they're going to be renewed. Well, because you're all, well, we're being very successful in spite of the leader. Well, so what happens is the leaders get in the ticker tape parade, and you think they're going to leave after 18 months. And I said, you all know what you have to do. You just have to have the moral courage to stand tall and do it. We don't give awards. We, for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty, or you know, a withering fire rained down upon you know, the, the convoy. She stepped forward, you know, knocked the machine gun out of the way, ran up, drugged the individual out of the, and you're reading this going, oh my God, this is unbelievable. But we don't have any awards that say, for conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty, when faced with ridicule from peers, seniors, and juniors alike, you know, the, the withering fire of ridicule is some, no, 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 I want to go jump in the vehicle and pull out, you know, the burning thing. I don't want to go in there and, mm. and have to do verbal combat or, or, I guess, ethical combat with someone who either works for me, because that's hard. If anybody, if anybody takes great pleasure in firing someone, you shouldn't be a CEO. You ought to be out of here. Because that ought to be something that you lose sleep over for two or three days and you yeah. put your heart and soul yeah. into it. So the moral courage, just as hard to muster up. Physical courage, it's now or never, and you're in it. And adrenaline's rushing, whoa, and you got it done. Moral you know, courage. As, as you're talking hard. about moral courage, it makes me think uh, that that's a place that faith can play a role in a lot of people. Because if, if your faith means something to you, there's, there's a bigger purpose, there's a bigger game going on and it emboldens us to do things that otherwise we might be a coward about. I agree. You carry this card around with you. I do. The Second Marine Division Daily Self-Assessment. Would you read this off, riff on it briefly, and this will be our closing benediction. Okay, well first of all, 17... You created, you created this, this is, yeah. this is your thing. 17,000 warriors in the division, and uh, we've tried to figure out how to, you know, if you have core values in your company, they're on your, on your web page, you know, ours are honor, courage, commitment for the Navy and the Marine Corps. The Army's got great ones. Leadership's the acronym, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. I mean, so when you hire a vet, you're not getting a, an infantryman or a tanker or an aviator. You're getting someone who's, who's really steeped in their core values. So uh, Sergeant Major and I came up with this. We said, okay, if we can't be with everybody every day and they had this card, what, we want them to, what would be the one thing we'd want to drive in, like your national security policy? One side says accountability, and it says I'm accountable for my Marines and sailors, accountable for my equipment, accountable for my actions, and accountable for my lack of action. That's mm. the one that kills mm. any organization. Mm. Oh boy, somebody ought to do something about that. Somebody ought to stop him. She's gonna get the whole place in trouble. I can't believe he's getting away with that. People who say that, you know, where's your, where's your legs? Get in the game. On the back of the card, we asked them to do three things on the way home every day. Ask yourself three questions. The first one was, who did I teach today? What did I teach him? The second one is, what did I learn today? And who did I learn it from? And the last one is, who did I make smile? Who did I put, who did I make smile today? Because any organization, especially in the military, when it's tough, and you can make people smile by a little humor, or you can make people smile by, by accomplishment. 
You know, this was so hard. No one expected us to get this done. No one thought that we could club this out of the park the way you all did. I just want to tell you right now, you have the right to strut today because you, you crushed it. You got that? <laughs> and they all go, oh, oh. You know, and you get, you get the, you know, the peacock. You know, you get the peacock. All right, we're all done peacock, and now we're going to be humble again. Out the, out the door you go. But you got to figure out a way to, you know, to get that juice on, uh, on that side. So... I said, I, I got a handful of these up here. I didn't, normally every midshipman gets this as a freshman. This is one of the handouts, and they get the Spartan code. That's what they get, and they keep it for the whole four years. And we're starting to see the selfless servant, and we're starting to see accountability. And, and the uh, last one I will say is the personification of, of this was a young Marine, 2004 graduate from Doylestown, Pennsylvania. His motto, think of this motto. His motto was, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? That was his motto. So if not me, then who? How would you like to walk into an organization and then and, uh, what's your, hey, this will, uh, our ethos is built on one saying, if not me, then who? I need a volunteer and you got 25 people. To do what? <laughs> to do what? You know, some organizations, I need a volunteer and you see nine people tying their shoe. You know? <laughs> So are you in a shoe tying organization or are you in a who oh, organization? <laughs> so I told the midshipman one time, I said, I know we're out of time, but I said, I don't have any, I don't have any ink. I don't have a tattoo, I swear. You'll have to take my word for it. But I told all the mid, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I have an Eagle Globe and Anchor, but you'll never see it. <laughs> so I looked at him, I said, I don't have a tattoo, and I'm not big on tattoos, obviously, or I'd have one. But I don't have one, but if you were going to get this tattoo, I'd, play, I'd pay for it. If not me, then who? If not now, then when? So about two weeks later, I'm, I'm at my house, and I get a phone call. And it's a couple of midshipmen who are actually, they're libating somewhere. And they go, they go, hey, General, you know that comment about that tattoo? Will you, he go, will you really pay for it? And I go, oh, my God, what did I create? So I go, no, 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 no. See, it's, it's just kind of a figure of speech I'm talking about. I said, if you get the tattoo, it'll fade and it'll get old. But if you live that, if you live it every day, that's the kind of tattoo you want. You want to live it. You got that? And it's real quiet on the other side. And they go, I guess that means you won't pay for it. <laughs> so anyway, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? All right, then. All right, then. So how about a huge word? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.